No, no, she's she's babysitting. I mean, she's <laughs> Uh, good morning. Um, you have your Bibles open to Judges, Book of Judges, in chapter three. This morning, Judges. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many as Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know um, to teach them war, at least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites, the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in the Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entering of Haman. And there were to prove, and they were uh, to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which He commanded uh, their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, uh, Hittites, Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and their groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushu, Cushan Rish, the Nahum, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Cushan Rish and Nahum. Thaim, eight years. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Okay, so we're going to begin to look at a number of the judges today. We're going to look in particular to Othniel and Ehud. Uh, so both would be judges that would judge Israel, and one follows the other, and we'll probably end up covering... Uh, at least two judges at a time, uh, with the exception of, of some that it, it might take a little bit longer just because of the amount of uh, material that we would have regarding uh, certain certain ones. Gideon would be one that uh, he takes a little bit more, there's more um, content to him, uh, as well as um, Samson and a, a few of the others, a few of the other accounts that we have. So the first one that we see, now mind you, um, this is Israel newly entered into promised land. And they, uh, if we were to read uh, not just the conquests that were in Joshua, but even the beginning of the first chapter, some, some going into chapter 2, uh, as we've seen last week, that at the tail end of Joshua's leading Israel, before he passed, they were able to go ahead and enter in, uh, but they weren't able to conquer everything that God had had for them. Okay, uh, in particular, he had promised that the land that they were walking on, uh, on to Abraham, the, they promised Abraham and the, the seed following, which would be them, is that they were supposed to have the land bordering, does anybody remember? Okay, <laughs> from the river of Egypt all the way to the great river Euphrates. Okay, so all the way from basically what would be now going to the Euphrates and Tigris all the way, which would be modern-day Iraq. Um, and did they take that? You, you guys can answer. Okay, no. <laughs> they didn't. All right. So we see the angel of the Lord coming to Israel and asking them, why have you done this? In other words, God's given it to you. Uh, I have made every provision available for you all to be able to go ahead and take what I've given. Why haven't you done this? You know? And then 
of the tribes that were there, they were not supposed to make a league. We saw that there was, uh, by means of deception, a league made, in, if we were to go back into Joshua, uh, where that took place, and of the tribes that were basically commanded to be wiped out. Um, they didn't. So God says, okay, I'm not going to drive them out from before you, but rather I'm going to allow them to be there, and they're going to be thorns in your sides, and I'm going to use them so that it would prove whether or not you are actually going to follow my commandments or not. Okay, so that's what we're picking up and we're seeing here. And we see almost immediately following the death of Joshua that you have children of Israel go ahead and violate God's law concerning them in particular that they're not supposed to give up their daughters and their sons. They're supposed to basically remain firm within themselves. Now that in particular is because their hearts would be turned from God Almighty, which we see happening. They got turned to, uh, they, it says here, they, and they served their gods, little g, in other words, they served the gods of, the, of those who were around, which weren't gods to begin with, okay? They were idols. And so uh, they served Balaam and the groves. So what God does is he allows them to be sold to their enemies. Their enemies come in, take over, and then by reason of the hardship of the bondage that they're in, in the difficult circumstances, they cry out to God, and God, in his mercy, raises up a deliverer. And we see this gentleman, says here, by the name of Othniel. Now, uh, out of curiosity, where else do we see this individual listed or named? He's not very familiar, but where else would we see him listed or named? Joshua? Yeah, actually. Uh, and in what context? Like, what... What do you do? What's like special about him? I mean, I know we, we, we read here, okay, he's a deliverer that God raised up. But. Didn't, he, uh, didn't he take, wasn't he the first to go out to either scale a wall or take a city or something? Okay, yeah, take a city. The account that we read of him in Judges is almost verbatim when we read about him in Joshua, which would be in Joshua chapter 15, actually. So um, it's, on, it's literally almost word for word. It's just basically like a recounting of what ha happened. And um, go to Joshua chapter 15. Joshua chapter 15. We'll start at verse 16. Uh, just <laughs> it's not the other. It's not that the other stuff isn't important, but it's, it's just a lot of material. Um, you have the accounting of the conquest of Judah's uh, tribe, in particular. It details as far as where their border was and all that. That's that's what we're gonna, that's what we'd be reading if you were to start at verse one. And then you have the layout of what city they conquered, where they went to, and then the, their, just their, their border region that was particular to Judah. Now, Caleb happened to be of the, uh, the tribe of Judah in particular. Now, he was also significant in, for what reason? What was, why, why was Caleb, like, what's important about him? What was? He defeated the giants, right? Okay, what else? He was one of the spies that went back and said, we can take the land. Yeah, and he was the part? oldest. That too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he's one of the only two of the surviving generation that was actually supposed to go in themselves, but were cursed to die because they didn't believe God. Uh, he was one of the twelve spies that went in to go out and spy out the land, and he was one of the only one outside of Joshua that came back and actually gave a good report. He believed God, and then. Uh, Joshua did as well, but the remaining ten did not, and as a result, because of their unbelief and their bad attitude, affected the nation in such a way that it brought down their spirits, and they cried to God, basically complaining, murmuring, and God said, I'm done with you all. <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, and then, so the thing is, it's, he cursed that generation uh, from 20 years and above. 
to, okay, you guys are going to die out here wandering. Um, and he would be one of the only two remaining of that generation that would actually see God's promise to let down. By the way, he was a really strong older man uh, that at 80 years old, he was he still had the, the, the same type of vitality and strength uh, of an individual that would have been at 40 when he was wanting to go in. And he still had that same passion and heart for God and zeal for God and faith in his promise that, you know, this is, this is my inheritance, so I'm going to take it. Okay, so in particular, this is in, while well, in the course of his, their conquest, uh, verse 16, and Caleb said that he smiteth, uh, he that smiteth Kirjath uh, Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb. Uh, in the judge's account, it's basically the younger brother. So Kenaz happens to be, if we were to go back into Numbers 13, and you list, and you go through the genealogies of the families, uh, in particular of Judah, then you'd see that Caleb is of the tribe of Judah, and also that Kenaz is mentioned in there as well. But then you have, so um, this is his nephew. Um, this is Othniel, the son of Kenaz, his brother Caleb took it, and he gave him uh, Aksa, his daughter, to wife. And then, well, and then she's going to ask for an inheritance. She's, she's a female. She wouldn't normally get one. It would be the sons that would be uh, receiving some type of inheritance. And so she pushes her husband, hey, ask him for an inheritance. And then he gives her uh, basically a plot. He gives to them a plot uh, with has uh, upper springs and lower springs. Um, on it, so they, they have water uh, that's there that's going to be given to them. So here's in, in our outline. Okay, so he's from the tribe of Judah. You can see that from uh, number 13. He's Caleb's nephew. He's Caleb's son-in-law. Now, um, he happens to be at our second point in our outline. He's a man of courage. We see that for a number of reasons. Okay, he took a city to win the hand of a woman. Okay, who does that? Okay. How many people do that? Well, I mean, not, not very many. I mean, we're, not <laughs> we're not of that time period now that, you know, normally, you know, you spend, what, is it like two months' salary, basically, to get a, to get a ring to go present to somebody if, you, uh, if you're interested? Well, if you already know, I would assume that by the time you get the ring and you're going to propose that you, you would have an idea that the person is going to say yes. Right, uh, even though that's not guaranteed necessarily, but uh, he was presented with an opportunity. He said, "Here's my daughter. You know, whoever wants her, you're gonna have to take that city." And he rises to the occasion and basically takes a city. Okay, how how populated was that city? We actually really don't know. But how how strong were the inhabitants? We really don't know. They could have been a Pretty uh, sizable challenge to him. Here, here's the difference, though. He had the power of God on his side, and he had enough faith in God that says, "Okay, hey, look, I know it's the same." He had the same mentality and approach as Caleb would have. I mean, granted, yeah, you're their family, but you know, how, how many other men would have stepped up or, or did step up or even attempt? We actually don't know because it's not accounted. Okay, so it's kind of an argument from silence. But nevertheless, he had faith in God that said, "Okay, I am going to." Go for this. This is an opportunity presented, and uh, we see that he actually did take the city, and as a result, uh, the daughter was given over. Um, I know it seems kind of silly, but like, okay, what kind of caliber uh, man do you think Caleb thought him to be? Pretty good. Yeah, I, th this guy's good enough for my daughter. And here's a man that, uh, you know, at 80 years old is just as strong as he was when he was 40 and had been waiting on God uh, despite his, the rest of his generation dying off with the exception of Joshua uh, to come into the promised land and to actually receive what was promised him by God. Uh, so this was a man of great faith, of great courage, uh, and we also see, if we go back to Judges, Judges chapter 3. Uh, 
verse 10. Okay. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went to war. And the Lord delivered Cusheth, uh, Cushan Rish, Athaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against said king. Okay, and the land was the land had rest forty years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Okay, so not much is said about him other than just that he was used of God, in particular, the Spirit of God rested upon him to deliver Israel. And he judged basically for over 40 years, and the land had rest as a result of his leadership. Now, it's sad that Israel would not long after he would pass, would fall back into uh, their stubborn way in which they would pursue their sin. Uh, they would give themselves over uh, back to idolatry uh, when they would have had strong leadership as such. But nevertheless, in the time that he led Israel, uh, after he delivered them, uh, they would be under peace. Okay, so <clears throat> delivered Israel under the power of God's Spirit. All right, so what's significant of that for us today that we can learn from? Now, understanding, okay, these things are written for our admission. Uh, so that we, you know, we could learn from them. You know, we could be built up on it. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should probably not ask questions. Go ahead. So you're asking what we should learn from? I have I have a list that I have. Okay, that I've got ready. I'm just. Uh, the spirit of God uh, brings power and. Um, ability that a lot of people don't have. Okay. Othniel in particular, um, I guess you could say he was, he, he was a, of a significant tribe, but regardless of his pedigree, we'll see this a little bit more with some of the others, okay? Regardless of their pedigree, the fact is that he made a personal decision and a personal choice to believe God. Okay, we'll see that that's consistent with most of the judges. Uh, though, not all the judges finish well, you can say, but in his case in particular, he made a personal decision, a personal choice, and it had uh, at least a habit of making right choices that would lead for not only the Spirit of God to come upon him, to raise him up, because you figure, okay, what would be significant? Why him of all the other folks, in, the, in not only just in his tribe, but of any of the other tribes? What was distinctive about him? How would we know? That? Well, the only reason we would know that is because of basically what God would have said about him and of his actions that we would see. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to tell necessarily. But yeah, he was faithful to God. He made it. He made choices. He made right choices. Said, "Okay, look, I believe God." And like his uncle Caleb, uh, he chose to act on on basically on God's promises to him for that. Uh, was that particular plot that he pursued his, like promised to him? Caleb was the one that actually was a, that declared, listen, I want that mountain. And yeah, he's related to Caleb, but he's not Caleb. No, but he said, <laughs> he would follow after, so okay, he followed, okay, in, um, go to Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, verse 7. It says, Remember them which have the rule over you, we have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And now this is the end of their conversation, the, the finality of their conversation. It says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then, you know, be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not been, uh, which have not profited them by, uh, 
that have been occupied therein. Okay. Um, I understand this is a different time period in this dispensation that's particularly written to the church, but the same concept, I believe, is something that was exhibited by Othniel. Okay? So he's not looking to worship Caleb. Now, Caleb is a, obviously is a good example uh, of somebody that is faithful to God and following God. Okay? And we don't, we don't worship men. Uh, we, we look to them for examples, and then we can see them as object lessons of of truths that God had given us in his word, but we worship the Lord Jesus Christ, we worship God Almighty. And uh, this, this principle, this, this command here, basically as far as in Hebrews 13, that uh, remember them to have the rule over you, and then uh, it says, whose faith follow, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Uh, so uh, It's the same thing as Paul had stated in, in 1 Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay, so we, again, it's not an exaltation of men, but if somebody's being faithful to God, then it's like, hey, that you mark them, and you you follow that, you follow that example, mm-hmm. you take the heart. Okay, you're not trying to be them, because you can't. God's made you specifically for you, and He He's gifted you in a distinct way uh, to to use you, particularly so that you can. Um, you know, you're, you're a member of the body, and so that you would benefit with all uh, the, the body, so that the body, the body increases, the body grows. Um, but the, the faith of those men uh, that we look to, and again, not, 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 a, not a man worship thing, but just simply, it's, it's like, wow, okay, he was used of God, or God, you know, God got blessed richly, and um, <clears throat> that is something that we should seek to, you know, emulate as well. And, and again, it's not to be lifted up, but rather it is to... A person being faithful to God is always going to uh, divert or deflect the, the attention to God. When, when, when somebody is faithfully following the Lord, they'll greatly use, regardless of whatever issues or insecurities and all that kind of stuff that he has, the fact is it's God that's glorified. So God will be remembered or God will be looked at and God will be seen as, wow, what a great God. And it's not to be okay. What a great person! But rather, it's it's what a great God, you know. And that that's what that's how Caleb was, and I believe that's what Othniel had seen in his uncle, as far as and that's what uh, Othniel practiced. Um, so we uh, that that would be a principle as far as okay. This is something that we can not only learn, but we should seek uh, seek, seek to be as. And then also just the fact is you know. Joshua was told, and not only just Joshua in particular, but the nation was told that be strong and have a good courage as they were going in initially uh, when Moses stood before them and then recounted the law. Uh, we see at the end of Deuteronomy and going into Joshua before they start having their first uh, conquest. Uh, be strong and have a good courage. Now why? It is because God is with them. So um, there's all kinds of things that you can fear, and certainly, you know, um, the devil's not, you know, some kind of weakling adversary, uh, but the thing is, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Um, and the fact is, regardless of whatever uh, arsenal the enemy has, God is greater than. It's not to be foolhardy uh, or reckless, but rather, it's confident in the fact that God is with me. Now you can have clear conscience of that. Obviously, if you're not, if you're walking close to him, maybe you're not walking in sin. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more difficult if you are, you know, not really close in your walk with the Lord, and then you go about as well. We'll see later on when we get to Samson, as far as with Samson, that uh, he was just he was just really reckless, and then when he uh, after his hair was cut, that uh, he got up <coughs> times before, and he knew not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And he goes about it in his own strength and his own ability, uh, without regard to, you know, the God or the Spirit of God. Uh, but we are to be men of courage, uh, ladies of courage, uh, believers. The Bible tells us that uh, He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound of mind. Okay, so we can be bold in our God. We can be 
uh, courageous, we can do great exploits. And it's not because you know we're such wonderful people, but rather it's because we have a wonderful God that is enabling us and it is empowering us. Uh, and that that's His desire as well, uh, because that's how that's how He, he glorifies Himself. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> let's go down uh, just a little bit further than we read about Ehud. Ehud. Because then the children of Israel did evil. This is verse 12 in chapter 3, Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Okay, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, uh, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of the palms. And so the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years quite a long time to be in bondage. Uh, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, uh, king of Moab. All right, so here's some things that are significant about Ehud. Uh, it says that he's of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, that's not really anything special uh, and Benjamin in particular was okay he was uh, Jacob's youngest son okay. he would have been of who else who was his mom David I mean Rachel Tasha. Rachel yeah okay his only his only full-blooded brother would have been Joseph Joseph okay. yeah so he was a son uh, of the, 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 the woman that he actually loved, that Jacob actually loved. Okay, so all the other, <laughs> all the other ones were treated like, well, comparatively like trash because he didn't really like love them like he loved Rachel. And then he, obviously he loved them more. He showed favoritism more towards them. But in particular, um, nothing really special about this tribe. Uh, they weren't a big tribe to begin with. And... Um, well, we won't see this yet, but fast forward, just kind of a spoiler alert. Uh, tribe of Benjamin is going to be almost wiped out. Uh, we'll see that later in Judges. And the reason why is because they're really foolish than that which is right in their own eyes. But uh, there would be a civil war within Israel, and then the tribe of Benjamin would be almost entirely wiped out. And then they get the whole scenario. Well, okay, we'll get into that later. But, um, anyway, so you have... He's, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, and it says that he was left-handed. Now, normally you just read over that, and you'd be like, okay, wow, big deal, okay, so he doesn't use his right hand. Go ahead. Uh, I looked up one time. It wasn't just he was left-handed. It's because his right hand was damaged. Yeah, actually, that, that was the words, the words meaning left-handed. The indication there is not just that his left was stronger, but that he, he was basically like handicapped. He had, he had, he had, his his right hand would have been bound, so he had like some kind of some kind of weakness or something physical, uh, either deformity or just a straight up handicap. Nonetheless, but he was handicapped as an individual, uh, limited to his left hand, and um, but he was nonetheless courageous. We see, well, we see the fact that he was courageous because of what he would do. Uh, he was raised up as a deliverer, and he would actually deliver Israel. Now, um, in the account here, we have that he comes before Eglon with a present. So the children of Israel send a present by the hand of, uh, to Eglon by the hand of Ehud. Okay, so he's just a messenger to, get, to deliver a present to them. But here's something that's a little different, uh, which I don't think he was expecting. Uh, it says here, that um, it says in verse 16, but Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he girded it under his raiment upon his right thigh. Okay, so he's got something beyond just a present to take with him to go see Eglon. Okay, he brought the present unto Eglon, uh, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries. Uh, 
that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had uh, for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have, I, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Okay, and the haft also went in after the blade and the fact closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out, out of his belly. And then the dirt came out. Okay, and then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And when he was gone out, the servants came by, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. They said, Surely he covered his feet in the summer chamber, and they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened the doors of the parlor, therefore they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And then Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed by the quarries and escaped unto Syria. And he came... To, and it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet at a mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountain and he said before them and, and, and he before them and he said unto them follow after me for the Lord hath delivered your enemies the Moabites into your hand and they went down after him and they took the Lord's uh, the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over and they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men all lusty all men of valor there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the, the land had rest four score years. So that's 40, uh, 40 years that they had rest. Okay, so what's significant about this? I mean, obviously, he showed great courage, uh, and then as a handicapped individual, he didn't let that stop him from going out and doing something that needed to be done, okay? Uh, he was raised in particular to deliver Israel from Moab. Now, was that God's will? Yes, because he was crying out, or excuse me, Israel was crying out and then he had raised up a deliverer. Um, they shouldn't have been in bondage to begin with, but they were because of their sin, okay? So we, that's gonna be something that's gonna be recurring, unfortunately. Uh, that we see, and something we should learn, obviously, is that <laughs> don't don't go into sin. Don't go, don't knowingly willingly go into sin. Uh, you know, um, this just popped in my head and it just popped out. As far as in Proverbs that we're told that the uh, foolish crash on and are punished. Uh, the wise man <coughs> foreseeth the evil. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the foolish crash on and are punished. Um, and so we, if we're to be prudent, we can foresee as far as the things or plan our lives, organize our lives so that we would be engaged in things that would please the Lord, that we would be seeking to fulfill God's will for our lives personally, individually, uh, and not, not just that, but also how it fits collectively within, within the body that he's placed you in, you know, and, uh, within your gifting. And we wouldn't have to end up as Israel constantly is here in this cycle. By the way, this isn't something that's necessary. You don't have to. You know, God's made every provision necessary for you to have victory in your life uh, over every, every sin in your life. Okay, um, He's given you a spirit uh, of power, of love, and of sound mind. Uh, and you are able to not just, okay, have maybe a moment or a day, but you can have prolonged periods of victory uh, where you can look back and say, wow, okay, I've you know, lived the will of God in my life without having to go into this cycle that Israel is finding themselves in and that okay, they have to have somebody that comes and delivers them and then they walk with God for a bit and then after that deliverer is done, then they go back to doing whatever they want to. And that's only by choice because they are stubborn. Okay, so we don't have to be like that. That's not necessary. That's not God's intent. Does it make sense? In other words, he, he wanted for them he wanted to bless them. He wanted to give them a lot more than what they actually received. But they didn't want that. Um, and okay, so he, uh, he didn't allow his handicap to stop him from fulfilling God's will. Uh, he didn't allow, also, by the way, he, he led Israel in the victory here. We're told, uh, verse 27 says, It came to pass when he was 
uh, when he was come, that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down on the mountain. And he said, he said unto them, in verse 28, follow after me. Follow after me. This is where the Lord had delivered your enemies, uh, the Moabites, into your hand. I, I know this is kind of silly, <laughs> but I'm like, uh, if you're in a military campaign, okay, now mind you, I know you've been under bondage for like 18 years uh, under this other nation that's a lot stronger, uh, but you're going to have some crippled guy come up. Yeah, man, let's go take him over. I mean, how confident you could be in that? I know that seems kind of like a silly thing, but like, I'm just saying, here's a crippled guy that comes out seemingly from out of nowhere and says, okay, hey, he's giving it to our hand. Let's, let's go ahead and, let's, you know, let's, let's take him over and let's take him out. Well, at the same time, I mean, if you say, you know, look, God has given this person who only has use of one arm the ability to kill the, the king, you know, what can God do with a person that has two arms? A lot. So, yeah. in my mind, it does give them courage. It's like the courage that uh, Israel had after David defeated Goliath. You know, if God can give David the power to kill Goliath, then what can he do with the rest of the army of Israel? It's incredible just the fact that, like, I'm, I'm taking it from, like, a devil's advocate perspective. Okay, I'm just trying to be, like, a little critical. And I'm thinking, okay, wow, here's a triple guy. God used him. And uh, he did something really incredible there. And mind you, it was the power of God on him, and it was God through him. Okay, But you have a nation stirred up to go ahead and break out from that. Now, couldn't they have done that before? Do you mean before, before he came this, or before they repented? Well, it, yeah, they, without without their having repented, then they wouldn't have, obviously, because God would have been against them, because He says that clearly. But they had they had the ability and they had the means. They just didn't have God on their side, and then here's how God shows Himself mighty on their behalf, is that He brings this cripple. Now, mind you. He does that because we're told in 1 Corinthians that no flesh should glory in his presence. Right? Here's this seeming like crippled nobody guy come around and then he you know, he's he's their deliverer. Who's going to take the glory for that? Well, God is. Well, God will take the glory regardless because the fact is he's deserving of the glory because he's the one that empowered and able. Yes. Yeah, you know, it sounds like the whole thing was planned even by Israel um, because he was presenting this gift. They would bring, you know, he was presenting this gift from Israel. So that's why it sounds like it was probably pre thought out by maybe top Israelites in the military or something. Because of fact, he was giving this gift, and with his hand damaged, the the king of Moab would think two hoots. This guy's not going to do anything, you know. It, it, it's something it, it, you could you could see because he was giving this gift. So it had been people from Israel, and so it had to be an expensive gift. So a once a year gift that they would give the king of Moab. It was a tribute that they were giving. It, that was a, that's a recurring thing that they would not only just them, but any of the other nations that would have been subjugate, subjects to Moab. Um, I don't know that they would have had... What makes me say that they wouldn't have had that as far as the pre-planning or anything like that, that's something that Ehud in particular would have had, is because God had raised him as a deliverer um, without counsel. Basically, God had worked on his heart, came upon him, and he decided, okay, hey, and this that would have been of the Lord's nudging or instructing, I guess you could say. Uh, text in particular just reads out that he 
was to give the gift, but he took with him a dagger and he put it on his right thigh, so he hit it. So he had in mind, okay, look, we, we, we need to be free, and this is how we're going to go about doing it. Whether he discussed it with anybody, I personally don't think he would have or did. I think it was just something, okay, that this is this needs to be done. We need to do this. This is what's right. We need to get free. Uh, Charlie, in verse 22, can Explain and the dirt came out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's two things. Okay, so you have the haft, which is you got the blade. The haft is okay. You got the handle, and you got that small portion or whatever right before, so that your you know your hand or whatever wow. doesn't come up onto the blade. And then the dirt is thought to be the one or two things. The tip. Like the tip of the blade itself. Oh, it came out the back of it. Yeah. Oh. oh. Or it could be just that. The dirt's the bows. Yeah, like his. I think it's he, the bows. Just, I remember looking. He would up. be. He would be relieving himself. It's one of the two yeah. things because those are the two oh. things that I came up as far as what I was studying, the oh. different, uh, like accounting commentaries and dirt. stuff like that. Mm. <laughs> so it'd either be like the, the actual, like the tip coming out through, or just when when a person. Usually when a person dies. He just like ripped the intestines. Maybe it was both. That's what I looked at. Yeah, he couldn't pull he couldn't pull his um he couldn't pull it out just because he was so heavy that the fan closed. So um that answer your question? No, I don't So Ehud, despite whatever uh, handicaps a person might have one, they can still be used of God, they can still be used of God to do great things, uh, to lead people, uh, motivate them to serve God. Now mind you, while he was alive prior to his death, it says that the land had rest for score years, and that's because he would have been judging them. <coughs> Moab was subdued. Um, and as with Othniel, that was used again to judge Israel, uh, when had rest, and that was because they would have been following God. Um, we'll see that as a consistent theme as far as with the judges. Not all of them finish well. There's nothing really accounted as far as that, you know, anything bad about how he ended other than just that he was able to be used of God to give the land rest and to free them from one of the bondages that they were under. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, we're going to be looking at Shamgar and then a few of the others that follow uh, next week. And uh, you guys are more than welcome, I would suggest also to read ahead and to study through and then uh, obviously any questions and uh, ask them uh, with regard to what you come up on the reading. And uh, if there's no more questions, right, well, we'll dismiss. Um, are we staying in Judges next week? Are we going to kind of be going through? You said Shamgar, is that something that's in Judges? Yeah, he's the next guy. He's the next one. That... In Judges? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's the next judge. We, yeah, I'm just going systematically as oh. far as like all of them. You know, oh. Some of them don't have a whole lot.